But Paul Heaton with them house Martin. John Griff at the weekend. BBC Radio Northampton. That's all still to come. And we might just give you a sneak peek at You're Having a Laugh, which, of course, comes up during the 8 o'clock hour before we talk to the TQ team here on BBC Radio Northampton. Now, our top story today is that of a woman from the south of the county who was suddenly hit by a rare and debilitating lung condition. She's calling for more awareness of her condition. Sarah Marshall is 36 and lives in Charlton, just near Brackley. She's got something called pulmonary hypertension. She's had to give up her job previously as a primary school teacher and she now has to spend most of her time at home hooked up to an oxygen machine. As she tells her story to Martin Heath, have a listen to what's whirring away in the background because it is keeping her going. When I was in, like, my early 20s, um, I suddenly noticed that I was getting really unfit. I couldn't keep up with my friends if we went walking. Um, I couldn't lift things very easily without getting out of breath. I couldn't skip. I couldn't do things I'd always been able to do, because I was really active. I was really... I was a primary school teacher, and I was really active and did lots of sports and stuff, and I, I just couldn't keep up with it. And I went to the doctor, and they just kept saying, um, you've got anxiety... And I went every single year for eight years and they just kept saying, oh, you've got anxiety or um, you've got stress or you're just getting unfit or you're getting old. Um, And they never did any tests and, you know, it was always sort of dismissed. And then one day um, when I was 32, I was just getting ready for work and I just suddenly collapsed. Um, And my legs gave way and I was all blue and I couldn't breathe and had to go to hospital and everything. And... At this point, it turned out that my pH, I'd had pulmonary hypertension for that whole time, um, but it had become quite severe by then um, and causing these really dramatic symptoms. So at this point, I entered the NHS and I started having lots of tests. And even then, it took a good six months until I actually got a proper diagnosis. So it took a while to get a diagnosis. So what effect does that have on your life? Clearly quite a major one. Yeah, it has had a really major effect on my life. Like I say, prior to this, I was very, very active. I was a primary school teacher. I taught little five-year-olds, so I was constantly surrounded by little children running around after them doing stuff. And then you go from doing that one day, and then the next day, I'm like lying on my sofa and I can't really do anything. And basically, I spend all my time now in my house, pottering around, and maybe making myself some food, hanging out with my dog. Thank goodness I've got a dog to keep me company. And I can't really do a lot. I, If I move around or um, do anything, I have to use oxygen, which you probably can hear now. Um, If I go outside, I have to use a mobility scooter because I just can't walk anymore. I stay downstairs all day because I can't go up and down stairs because stairs are a nightmare. So it's had a very dramatic effect on my life. I just basically spend all my time reading and doing puzzles and writing and things these days. So, yeah, very different. What's the support like for people with this condition? Because it is comparatively rare, isn't it? Yes, it is very rare. We're very lucky that there is an organisation um, called the Pulmonary Hypertension Association who were wonderful when I was first diagnosed because for such a small charity, you know, it's a really good organisation. When I got diagnosed, they just sent out loads of pamphlets, loads of information. You know, they've got like people on the end of the phone to talk to you about it. It was brilliant. It explained everything because when you get diagnosed, the doctors say, don't Google it because it's full of horror stories about, you know, how long you're going to live and all this kind of stuff. Whereas a charity sent you all this information so you know exactly the facts about it, the most current research and stuff. Um, And we're also very lucky because the way the NHS works, there are centres dotted around the country, I think there's about six centres, that specialise in pulmonary hypertension because obviously the majority of doctors in the country don't actually actually know anything about it. Most GPs aren't really aware of it. What have you done to to raise awareness? My husband's fabulous and he is um, very much, he took up running when I got ill and so over the last, whatever, um, the last few years he's done lots of runs and things to raise awareness of pulmonary hypertension and raise lots of money um, for the charity. So we have, you know, um, done, been in newspapers and things like that trying to sort of raise awareness and I also write a blog which I've been doing for a year and a half now. Now you are on the list for a transplant What are the prospects of getting one and what difference would it make if you did? I'm um, on the waiting list for a double lung transplant and I've been on it for about 14 months now. Um, The likelihood of me getting one is about an 80% chance of getting one. Unfortunately, because there is a big shortage of um, potential donors, not everybody that's on the list will get one in time. I think the statistic is 25% of people that are waiting for lungs won't actually get one um, in time. 
every day I wake up and wonder whether I'm going to get a call. You, you know, if I did manage to get new lungs, it would change my life completely. Um, I'd be able to um, get out of the house. I would get some of my strength back. I'd be able to walk and things again. I mean, obviously, transplant is not a cure. I'm going to therefore be taking pills and things for the rest of my life. And, I'm, um, you know, you, you, your life prospect is obviously only going to be a few years longer with it. But for those few years, it would be amazing. I would love to have my life back, even if it's just for a short while. It's quite um, some story and it's quite some wish, isn't it? Sarah Marshall, who lives in Charlton near Brackley. Pulmonary hypertension. Have you ever heard about it before? We're bringing attention to it today here on BBC Radio Northampton. And we'll be uh, looking at what others say about the condition a little bit later on during the course of breakfast today. Where can you find out more? Are there organisations that help people with pulmonary hypertension? There are. And we'll tell you about them too. <laughs> Northamptonshire weather. BBC Radio Northampton. Rather a cloudy... That's the story of Sarah Marshall. And by the way, that humming, buzzing sound that you heard in the background to Martin Heath's report there, uh, it wasn't a particularly noisy deep freeze. It's actually the oxygen machine that helps Sarah Marshall stay alive. About 7,000 people in the UK have pulmonary hypertension. A recent survey out suggests that the disease has a huge effect on their lives. Nearly half of patients will have to wait more than a year just for diagnosis. Ian Armstrong chairs the Pulmonary Hypertension Association. He says the delay in getting a diagnosis is a really big problem. For a rare disease that actually has a consequence of undiagnosed and untreated as a life expectancy, once diagnosed, is only about two years is really quite worrisome because if we can diagnose earlier we can treat much earlier and life expectancy is much better still shortened an average of about eight years and when you're 14 50 that's still really quite a young you know mm. sort of more, more, more well, shortened life expectancy the early start treatment as with most serious conditions you have far better outcomes. Ian also says, perhaps surprisingly, that he doesn't want to see more specialised centres for people with the disease. Instead, he just wants to raise awareness of it. What you want with, with a rare disease like this is high expertise. Now, if you have more treatment centres, what you do is you water down expertise by definition. So you've got to get the right figure of, of where you can see a number of people with the same condition so you can you can manage them better giving them the right support probably one of the biggest needs is those centers that exist at the moment in the uk and the, the seven in the uk is ensure that they can manage this patient population well as in the right diagnosis and the right support the type of support that's lent to people who quite rightly deserve as much support say with Finances, accessing uh, benefits and things like that. Is that even the benefit system, the people working in benefits, just you're starting off with a, I, I don't understand this. I, I do understand if something's really serious. So I think it's a more of an awareness and a more of an acceptance that rare diseases do exist and require as much support as those more commonly uh, known conditions who quite rightly get the right support. You can go online and find out more about the Pulmonary Hypertension Association. From it, you heard Ian Armstrong, and we'll keep you posted on the story of Sarah Marshall, now waiting for a double lung transplant. The BBC in Northamptonshire. BBC Radio Northampton.